Hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Luke Tudball. I have the joy of welcoming you here to the 2022 Virtual Town Hall series with Delegate Bagnon. We are here for the first of the series for the Maryland General Assembly Legislative Wrap Up. And without further ado, I'm just gonna go through a very quick ground rules and then we'll get on with uh, the presentation by Delegate Bagnon. Uh, please keep yourself muted unless you are asking a question and uh, to save bandwidth, if you can, you can also switch off your video screen. Otherwise, if you have a question, please write question in the chat followed by the question itself. And we will uh, look through there and answer as many questions as we can in the time we allow. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Delegate Bagnon. Are you getting any feedback? Okay. Thank you so much for joining us today for the first of our 2022 legislative session virtual town hall series. I'm Heather Bagnell, your delegate in District 33. I first wanted to thank you all once again for your continued commitment to our community as we experience another COVID surge. We are not yet out of the woods with COVID and the transition from pandemic to endemic continues to bring with it new challenges. I also wanna take a moment of personal privilege to thank my chief of staff, Caroline Hecker, who has been covering for me as I experienced firsthand the challenge of COVID-19, having tested positive while traveling abroad, which forced the extension of my visit by an additional 10 days. Though we are seeing a relaxing of restrictions, COVID is very real and still present, and it requires everyone to ensure we keep our community safe, our businesses open, our children in our school buildings, and our live arts alive. I'm going to admit something to you now. I considered canceling tonight. For the last three weeks, I've watched events from England feeling slightly helpless. The leaked Supreme Court draft opinion and its implications on privacy, autonomy, access to contraception, IVF, marriage equality, interracial marriage, the mass shooting in Buffalo. And yesterday, after a five-hour bus ride and an eight-hour flight, I stepped off the plane to the news of a mass shooting at an elementary school in Texas, which to date has left 19 children and two school teachers dead. I know you didn't come here to hear about these tragedies, but I can't pretend they are not weighing heavily on my mind. And I would be remiss if I didn't take every opportunity to make this ask. This is an election year. So I'm asking you whenever and wherever you have opportunity to ask every candidate how they are going to prevent the next tragedy, how they will ensure that our children aren't hearing the message that they are expendable, that they aren't a, a, a reasonable price for freedom because, because I will keep fighting, but I truly can't do it alone. So tonight I'm gonna to talk about our legislative successes uh, our failures and where I forecast we're going to go next. If you haven't yet done so, please be sure to subscribe to my social media. I primarily use Facebook and Twitter for immediate information and so as not to clog up your inboxes, but I do send updates on events and issues within the community. I will warn you, I've been accused of many things, but brevity is not one. Thank you for being here tonight and for your help and advocacy throughout the session. I especially wanna thank our congressional partners who have been working side by side with us throughout the pandemic. I also, I, I, I'm, I, I'm going to work to keep this call to an hour to respect your time and because, because I know we're all a little zoomed out. So I'll attempt to answer any questions, but if, if we can't get to your question on the call, we will circle back with you to make sure you have answered. If you have a question and have not submitted it in advance, please feel free to put your question in the chat. I also wanted to thank once again, Caroline Hecker, my chief of staff and Luke Tudball who consistently work behind the scenes to make me look far more tech savvy than I am and always on top of every issue. Following tonight's town hall, please feel free to email my office and we'll get back to you as quickly as possible. And from here out, we're just having a conversation. So I wanna talk a little bit about uh, what we did this session. Um, it was once again, a, a, a very successful and comprehensive session despite 
all of the challenges that, that were posed by COVID and, and, and the recovery effort. Um, this, this year, unlike last year, we were all back in, in, the, in the same place, although we still had, um, had some restrictions. We, the, the house was actually um, working virtually during our entire uh, committee process and in person on the floor. The Senate was uh, working a little more hybrid in the beginning and then went to fully in person about halfway through the session, which um, I'll admit brought with that, with that its own challenges um, as we tried to uh, reconcile the protocols and the, the discrepancy between protocols for the House and the protocols for the Senate. Um, we continue to consider sort of the lessons learned from this legislative session and from uh, how we adapted to this hybrid model, because we have found that in some ways, um, having virtual hearings or, or having a virtual option for hearings has, um, has uh, expanded access for, for a lot of Marylanders. It meant that they didn't have to um, deal with transportation, childcare, with taking a day off of work to come down to Annapolis and lobby. Um, and, and I know that the, 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 the leadership between the House and the Senate are still having discussions as to how, um, how we wanna move forward with that. The Senate, the Senate took a, a much less um, COVID hybrid uh, policy than the House did. Um, and we're, we're really looking at, you know, once we're sort of in the endemic phase, once we're, 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 we're past, um, you know, past uh, the, the, the COVID surges and the, the unpredictability, how we can adapt some of what we have, have learned into making, um, making a more accessible uh, Maryland General Assembly session for, for all of our Marylanders. Um, we had a really, really successful budget. Uh, which, which we're, we're very proud of. Um, 2023 budget passed with a record $2.4 billion in the rainy day fund. Now this is for emergencies. Um, and and uh, it, it means that if we have another uh, pandemic, if we have another emergency, even if we have you know, a, a declaration of an emergency that, that we have the funds, we have the resources to address it. Um, and, uh, and, and we funded over $650 million in, in uh, priorities across the state for, for education, um, for support for mailenders with, with the greatest need, for employee benefits, um, cost of living increases. Um, within the operating budget, we had uh, $800 million for future blueprint education funding, which means that we have now fully funded uh, the entire 10 year expansion of, of the blueprint for Maryland's future. That's huge um, because there were concerns that, um, that we had only funded it for, for six years out and what would happen in the event of, of an economic downturn or, or a recession. So now we've, we've, we've put the funds in place so that, so that um, we, will, we will not get halfway through that process and, and, and have to, to, have to uh, terminate the program. Um, $50 million set aside for families to afford childcare, um, an increase of, of uh, about $150 million in funding for crime prevention and, and victim services. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to that in a little bit. Uh, $100 million in funds to create more affordable rental housing, $202 million for providers serving vulnerable populations, $35 million towards benefits for cash assistance recipients, um, 27 million to expand Medicaid dental benefits for adults. That is, um, that is a, a game changer. Uh, 50 million for grants for arts and tourism organizations, uh, 47 million for implementation of cannabis reform, 30 million provided to serve about 1,350 youth on the autism waiver uh, waiting list. Uh, 9 million to address climate impacts, 10 million to launch paid family leave, 36 million to support economic developments and revitalization efforts. Um, we did pass uh, significant tax relief this year as well. Um, you know, we were trying to be responsive to the, the challenges posed by uh, the COVID recovery 
um, as well as as um, as the realities of, of rising inflation and um, and and sort of economic uh, unknowns. So we did pass the gas tax holiday. Um, we passed retirement tax relief, um, which has been something that that the General Assembly has been called upon for 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 decades to, to, to find relief efforts for, for our seniors. Um, we passed um, income tax subtractions for union dues, for uh, tax exemptions for, for diapers and, and baby products, uh, medical devices, uh, oral health, uh, oral hygiene products. Um, we did pass some bills in the house that did not make it through the Senate. Um, so we'll be bringing those back next year. Uh, one was an income tax modification for military and uh, public safety retirement income. Um, that one passed the House uh, for, for some reason. It, 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 um, I believe it got stuck in committee in the Senate. Uh, we also had a bill specific to Anne Arundel County, which was for um, disabled and fallen law enforcement officers and rescue workers, surviving spouses, cohabitants. Um, it was a property tax credit. It was actually modeled after um, a tax credit uh, that originated in Baltimore. But, um, but we were trying to model it here in Anne Arundel County because right now that tax credit um, it sort of goes county by county. So if you relocate, it does not follow you. So we were trying to expand that eligibility for, for um, law enforcement uh, retirees. But, um, but that bill didn't, uh, it didn't make it out of the Senate. Um, so we'll, we'll be bringing that back again next year. Um, one of the things that, that was a, a, a major priority of, of our delegation and um, of, of my office in particular was uh, the Crownsville uh, Hospital uh, Park. Uh, because um, as, as you know, uh, when um, County Executive Stuart Pittman ran for office, he ran on revitalizing the Crownsville uh, Hospital site. Um, and he's been in the process of negotiating that transfer from the state. It's currently under the auspices of the state. Um, as, as many of you know, in uh, 2019, I worked to ensure that if the site where the Anne Arundel County Food Bank was um, uh, resided, if, if that transferred from state to county hands, that um, that the food bank would be able to remain on that site. And we worked with uh, the, the governor's office and in, in his administration. We worked with the county executive's office in his administration uh, with the secretary of health, uh, Secretary Neal at the time, um, and a number of our delegation partners to ensure that uh, the food bank could get a long-term lease and therefore get funding to repair the roof. Um, but... Um, but the county executive has continued this effort to uh, to move that property from the state to the county, and um, in I believe it was March, the uh, Board of Public Works made the first um, effort to uh, to designate that site as a surplus, which may, which uh, paves the road for for the county acquiring it. But there's a lot of remediation that goes into that effort. And so um, when the proposal to, uh, to see that that property of the county came with $2.5 million, I, I knew um, that that wasn't going to, to get us far enough um, because with, with our remediation efforts. So we worked with the delegation, we worked with the administration, um, we worked with the General Assembly to approve uh, $30.5 million and that will start the ball rolling on the acquisition, the planning, the design, the, um, the renovation, the uh, remediation of that property to make sure that, that we can really um, effectively create the Crownsville Memorial Park. And, uh, and along those efforts, we, I also sponsored a legislative, a legislative bond initiative for the Say My Name Memorial, which is at the Crownsville Patient Cemetery. So, um, for those who may or may not know, from, from about 1911 to 2004, um, the Crownsville Hospital Center was operational and it was originally um, 
it was a state psychiatric hospital. It was originally the, um, the hospital for the Negro insane of Maryland. That was, that was the, the, uh, that was what it was designated. And obviously over time that, that changed, but there are a number of, um, of grave sites on the, the property. There's a cemetery on the property. And because of um, privacy restrictions, they originally didn't have names. They just had number designations. And there's been a, a, a concerted effort um, by historians and archivists to identify all of the patients who are buried on that site um, and, uh, and, and we now have the names of over 1600 patients buried in the cemetery. And so we will be establishing a memorial with all of their names, their birth date, their death date, so that, um, so that they will, they will be remembered for, you know, um, and, uh, and we will make sure that we are honoring the legacy of, of that site. Um, we also were able to get uh, additional funding for the Anne Arundel County Food Bank. Um, during the pandemic, the food bank went from supplying about a million and a half pounds of food to over 7 million pounds of food for Anne Arundel County residents. And so the, um, we secured funding for them so that they could actually expand their efforts and also create um, a dedicated, um, a dedicated uh, arm of, of their of their uh, of their food bank to make sure that they can continue to be resilient. Um, we also uh, funded the uh, the Harold L. Turner uh, Post 276 American Legion. During the pandemic, they were trying to um, do a, a, a renovation of their kitchen. They were serving a lot of, of, of families, veterans. Um, they also work with local charities such as women's shelters, boys and, uh, boys and Cub Scouts, um, civil, civil air patrol, uh, disabled veterans organizations. So we were able to secure funding for them so they could um, expand their, their kitchen and, and, and uh, really in, in ensure that they could, they could expand their efforts and in, in their, their reach to the community. Um, as, as you know, I, I continued on the uh, Anne Arundel County Delegation uh, Capital Budget Committee. Um, this year, I, I, I was just a member. Um, Shanika Henson has now taken, taken the mantle of, um, of chair of the Capital Budget Subcommittee while I was vice chair of the uh, Anne Arundel County Delegation. But we worked together to secure funding for the Anne Arundel County Fairgrounds for Benfield Elementary School. Children's Theater of Annapolis, they are going to be able to do their, their expansion for their annex and, and really uh, renovate that space. And that's going to become an incredible resource for, um, for uh, the lower Broadneck Peninsula and um, Rebel Downs, that community. Um, the Kinder Care Veterans Resource Support Center, we were able to get them $850,000 in funding. The Pasco Crisis Stabilization Center, uh, Senior Dog Sanctuary, Verna Park American Legion, Post 175, um, South Shore Recovery Club, Parking Lot, um, also the Wild Chapel Swim Club. Um, so we, 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 we brought a lot of resources to Anne Arundel County, which we're very proud of. Um, I'm just going to touch on a couple of pieces of legislation that I worked on and then some of the like big legislation of, of the session. Um, and then I'll open it up to, to any questions that you might have. Um, also, I, I just want to make you aware that, that we are going to have some other town halls going forward um, that are going to be more specific to like the health care policies that we passed and some of the veterans policies that we passed and um, and uh, and we will you know check your email because we've got the whole list of, of all of the um, the upcoming virtual town halls and we'll we'll um, reiterate that uh, before the meeting is over but the legislation that I worked on this year we were able to pass um, I believe six bills uh, passed and and made it to the governor's desk. Um, a couple of bills passed the House but didn't make it past the Senate, so we'll be bringing them back next year. And then we have a couple of bills that um, that we're going to continue to work on, um, just because they, yeah, that the, there just wasn't time in the session. Um, 
But I worked on uh, a bill, H HB 32 was an electronic transfer of emergency petitions. Um, and what that was, cur the, cur the current law required that basically the, the paperwork for, for an emergency petition had to follow the, um, it had to, to, to follow the patient. So uh, in order to emergency petition someone, that paperwork had to be filed. It had to be driven. You know, if it, if it was in one location, it had to be physically put in a car and driven to another location. Um, so we're just meeting the moment and acknowledging that we have the technology now to transfer, um, to transmit those, those um, emergency petitions from one jurisdiction to another and really cut down the time um, that, that is required to, to, um, to get an evaluate into care, um, which is, as you know, is, is a, a, a top priority of mine all the time. We want to get people into the appropriate care in as, um, as minimal a time frame as possible. Um, so we were, we were able to, to move that, that bill in, um, and the governor signed, signed, uh, signed up the, the bill as well. Um, we also extend, did a sunset extension for the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. Um, if you've heard me talk before about compacts, they're a really great way for us to, to help our, uh, our, our health providers um, and also help our uh, constituents because it allows uh, health providers to operate across state lines so long as they're adhering to uh, Maryland law and um, keeping their license uh, up to date. Um, and it became really important during the pandemic because we, you know, be, being that we are basically a, a tri-state area with Maryland, DC and Virginia and even Delaware, um, we have uh, a lot of, of providers that, that, that operate across state lines during the pandemic with telehealth, uh, that became even more important. And we also have a lot of military and military spouses who are, um, before the compacts were required to get a license in each location where they were practicing, um, where they were stationed. And this allows them to use that same license, that Maryland license and operate in any state that has the compact. Um, I, also was really proud. Um, I passed a bill um, working with the community action agencies to provide uh, feminine hygiene products for low income Marylanders. This was actually an idea that was brought to me by uh, a young woman who was working on period poverty last year or two years ago um, as part of a Girl Scout, um, Girl Scout project. And she brought the, the she brought this to us last year. We, we we put in a bill, but we didn't quite get there. We couldn't quite figure out how to um, to, to uh, get the, the the budget language just right. So this year, we we worked with the community action agencies. We worked with the Department of Health. We worked with our committee, and we worked with um, with uh, the budget office to figure out exactly how to do it. And it's a it's it's a pilot program. It's going to be working with three community action agencies across six counties, um, who already sort of have the uh, who already have the connections within the communities to, to make this work so that we can evaluate how best to do it and how best to, uh, to roll it out statewide. And the goal is that, um, that we'll pilot it for three years in these, in these um, counties and that we'll use that data to, to uh, expand it statewide um, within the next five years. We also passed uh, the commission to establish a women, a Maryland Women Veterans Memorial. And you may have heard me talk about this before. This is a bill that we had in the last couple of years, we had it in as a joint resolution between myself and the Senate. Um, and it, it didn't move. It didn't move out of house rules. It, it, it moved in the Senate, but it didn't move in the house. And, and being that this was, uh, this is an election year, it didn't make sense to ask the governor who's, who's in his final term uh, permission to, to create the commission or ask the governor to create the commission. So we put it in as a bill. Um, and, and I was, I was really uh, honored to work directly with the Veterans Affairs Commission. We, we really sort of put them in, in the driver's seat on, on um, staffing this commission. And um, 
and also uh, the the uh, my entire my entire committee uh, signed on as co co sponsors of the bill um, because it 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 went from being sort of this 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 effort that wasn't moving to a, a priority of of our of our committee so that was really exciting to see um, and the uh, the, there were two other bills that that um, that we successfully passed. One was the Psychiatric Hospital Admissions Equity Act, and this this is a bill that was um, again, it, you know, my my efforts around mental mental health are, are well documented. But but one of my priorities with mental mental health is is adolescent access, but also equity in healthcare. And it's a, a constant challenge because we have equity in the law. Um, the the uh, Affordable Care Act required parity within the law, but parity within the law isn't always um, possible because we don't have parity in resources. So even though we have parity in reimbursement, we don't necessarily have parity in resources. Um, so the, the 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 Maryland Department of Health, previous to um, a, dis, a decision to allow certain waivers was um, requiring that anyone who was on Medicaid, if they needed an emergency petition, if they needed long-term care in a psychiatric hospital, like a specialty hospital, something like Shepherd Pratt, that, um, that five calls needed to be made to other facilities before they could approve um, that transfer. And it wasn't, um, based on any sort of medical necessity. It was based on, um, purely on, you know, the economics uh, of the time. Um, so once we had that waiver, uh, once we had the feds that had signed off on that waiver, we passed this bill, which basically prohibits uh, the department from limiting or restricting admissions of Medicaid recipients, unless the decision is based on medical necessity. And it also creates a process whereby it's, it creates a much more um, transparent process whereby that evaluation process is reviewed, um, so that so that we're not making regulations that that aren't medically necessary and that aren't medically beneficial um, to to uh, the patients. And and so uh, I was I was really proud that we were able to do that because it's it's basically a prophylactic bill. It, it prevents us from from making. Um, decisions that are not in the best interest of, of the care of, of Marylanders. Um, and the other bill that I worked on that, that I was, again, really proud of was, uh, it's a um, House Bill 1389. It was the Public Awareness Campaign Work Group. And um, it was to prevent um, workplace uh, violence for healthcare providers. And um, it it, workplace violence, um, about 75% of workplace violence occurs in healthcare settings. We've only seen that get worse at, uh, with the pandemic. And um, about two years ago, the Maryland Nurses Association put out a, a survey to their, um, to their clients and to their members and said, you know, what is you know, what are you, what are your priorities? Uh, what would you like to see us do? And their number one priority was reducing workplace violence uh, in healthcare settings. And, um, and, and they did get to work and the hospitals and, um, and uh, private settings and have, have created all kinds of policies, so zero tolerance policies, zero tolerance policies and um, increased security and um, de-escalation training, but they've kind of done as much as they can do without public buy-in. So, um, so we create, we passed a bill to create this work group that will look at how, what we need in a, in a public, in a public campaign and how we fund it and how we roll that out. Um, because, because, because the, the problem is now, um, and, and, and really we, we, we can't wait any longer. So, um, so we, we passed that bill and, uh, and we'll, we'll be looking at, at, at this, um, public facing campaign within the next year, because, um, because we're seeing a, 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 
a tremendous exodus of our healthcare providers when we are already sort of in a, a work a workforce development uh, crisis. So um, the, there, there were a couple other bills that, that I worked on and I worked really hard and unfortunately they just didn't make it across the threshold. One was the Behavioral Health System Modernization Act. And I know you've heard me talk about that quite a lot. Um, it's an expansive, um, evidence-based, uh, basically um, huge, uh, comprehensive bill to um, to make our, our, our very good behavioral health system into a great behavioral health system. There were pieces of it that, that sort of made it across the threshold this year as, as other legislation. Um, but this, this particular comprehensive omnibus uh, behavioral health legislation did not uh, move. And so we are going to evaluate during the interim what pieces we were able to accomplish and um, and bring the bill back next year because it, it really it, it really would make us like you know first in the nation on behavioral health. Um, it, it was it looked at community based treatments, certified community behavioral health uh, clinics, um, improving uh, outcomes uh, through um, expanding delivery of individualized data driven measurement based care. Um, strengthening peer-to-peer -peer services, strengthening workforce, um, strengthening uh, our our uh, our crisis uh, mobile you know our mobile crisis teams and crisis intervention teams, um, but we just didn't get there. But we did um, we did have record investment in public health. So I you know I I, I greatly appreciate how much work we actually did. Um, and we've got a couple other bills, like we had a licensure qualification for psychologists, which is, it, it's, it's kind of nuanced, but essentially there was a program uh, for psychologists to get licensed. That program went away. So sort of it left uh, folks who were seeking um, licensure, but, but um, were licensed psychologists in a non-clinical setting. It, it sort of left them in a position where they couldn't um, get a uh, clinical re-specialization. So if they wanted to actually be serving the public rather than, than working in a non-clinical setting such as, as such as research, there was no path other than going back and get a second doctorate. So we, we, we got the language, we, we, we had everything worked out. We just ran out of time. It made it through the house and just didn't make it through the Senate. Um, and we had a sign language, uh, Maryland Sign Language Interpreters Act which also made it through the House, didn't make it through the Senate. Um, this is a bill that has had multiple sponsors over the last few years. Um, and we really thought we had, we had it where it needed to be, um, but there were, there were some, some sticking points in the Senate. Um, but we think, we, think we, we, we have a, a clear path to, uh, to getting it passed. And it's really about, again, it's about equity. Um, anyone who's seen the movie Coda understands that um, there are, um, disparities in, within uh, within the the, the 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 deaf and hard of hearing community, and having an interpreter who you know ha having not having a, a common standard for interpreters is is not only um, an equity issue but it's a safety issue, um, and it, and it's a, it's a legal issue because if you have an interpreter, for instance, who is uh, interpreting in a healthcare setting. Or um, a court setting, and you don't have accurate interpretation uh, um, that that can that can have have very real world consequences. So um, I'm certain that we are going to get that across the threshold next year. Uh, that's definitely a priority um, to make sure that that we get that passed. So what were the big bills that that um, the General Assembly worked on? Well. Um, there were there were quite a few. I think uh, one of the ones that 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 um, was very high profile was the Time to Care Act, and that is the family and um, uh, the family paid uh, paid family and medical leave. Um, and that was, you know, during the pandemic, um, one of the things that we saw was was how many people had to sort of figure out how they could take care of their families and how they could also provide for their families. And there really weren't 
a lot of resources uh, for people unless you know it was it was it was just really inequitable. You, you know, some people had a job where they were they 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 had a lot of um, safety uh, networks built into their jobs, and others they just they were just kind of on their own and had to make those those really um, tough decisions. Um, also, you know, new families where, you know, they might have two weeks of leave, um, but they're expected to, to be the, you know, the, to be the, the full-time provider for their family. Um, so, so we were really proud to pass that. And that's been years in the making um, to, to pass that bill. Um, we also passed um, the, the ghost guns bill, the, uh, the untraceable firearms bill. And, and again, that was a response to a rising uh, trend of these, um, these untraceable firearms that, that, are, that are being produced, um, many of which are being produced um, because you can, there are, there are loopholes within the law for, for um, buying firearms piecemeal and um, I think it's called the 2080 law or 8020 law, where as long as only 20 percent, uh, only 20 percent of the, the firearm is, is, is manufactured, um, it, it previously did not have to actually be, um, be licensed. So it's, it's a loophole that, that was very problematic and concerning. Um, and and, uh, and we, we, did, we did pass that, that bill this year. Um, we also did a lot around childcare. Um, childcare was a huge issue during COVID. It's it's always been a huge issue, but I think um, I think it really uh, came to to the forefront uh, during during the pandemic when folks were, um, especially when when folks were were um, teaching teaching from home, teaching remotely, um, because. The childcare industry has moved to this model that is really centered around like large childcare facilities, which were unsustainable during the pandemic, um, but incredibly important when people were going, you know, back to the office. Um, so we passed the child care stabilization and child care expansion grant program. We passed chair, uh, therapeutic child care program. We passed a child care capital support revolving loan fund, um, all to try and stabilize the child care market and make sure that, that we were expanding that resource. Um, we also passed Climate Solutions Now. Now, this is the bill that last year um, just sort of died in the final hours of the session. Nobody really knew what happened um, because the House thought it had passed, the Senate thought it had passed, and then it turned out, you know, you know, one minute after sign and die that it hadn't, it hadn't crossed the threshold. So this year there was a commitment early on in the session to make sure that we were going to, um, to, to pass this bill. And this is, this is, you know, to reduce our greenhouse gases and meet net zero statewide emissions by 2045. Um, it put, it puts Maryland as, as a leader in climate change. Um, it establishes work groups uh, to look at um, transition employment, retaining work, workforce, um, energy industry revitalization, um, energy resilience and efficiency, um, and solar uh, photovoltaic uh, systems recovery, reuse, and recycling. So that we, so that we're we're capturing and we're um, uh, you know we're figuring out how to uh, decommission and dispose and recycle our solar panels because we know that they're that they're. Even, even with solar and wind power, there are additional challenges um, that are posed. Um, we also passed the electric school bus pilot program. Um, now that's a three-year pilot because uh, again, there's a lot of, there's there, anytime we're trying to do things um, with sort of long-term impact and long-term goals, there's always that hesitation of, can we do it? Can we do it now? Is now, now the time to do it? I think I think as we're seeing, um, you know, this spike in inflation, the spike in gas prices, it's feeling more and more like these, these were probably very forward thinking uh, initiatives. Um, but we're still, you know, we're still trying to be um, 
responsive and responsible to, to our constituency. And especially with things like school buses um, and, and even the Clean Cars Act, um, we know that those have like real world implications on particularly on our, our, our counties and municipalities. So we wanna make sure that, that we're not, um, you know, sort of jeopardizing our county budgets um, and, and our, our, our county boards of ed and putting them in a difficult position. So we so we, we were uh, a little conservative, a little um, uh, you know, conservative on that. The Great Maryland Outdoors Act um, was just a, a, a really exciting, you know, increase in, 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 in our funding for parks because um, during the pandemic, again, we saw this huge explosion of, of utilization of our, our state and national parks um, to the point where, where uh, we didn't even have the staff to, uh, to, uh, to meet the need. Um, and I think it became very clear that we haven't done the level of investment in our in our parks in in quite quite a, a, a you know in, in 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 decades where we've been underfunding our, our parks and so um, this this uh, bill and this funding will allow us allow our state parks to to um, address backlogs of um, of maintenance projects and repairs. Um, it, it allows us for new it allows for new land acquisition to expand the parks better public access, um, historic preservation, um, and some of, you know, and addressing some of those like, like the flooding mitigation and also um, uh, ADA enhancements um, and staff enhancements. So it's, it's, it's really exciting that we were, that we were able to do this and, and really leverage the, 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 the power between the county and the state parks um, to, to get a, a, a better partnership. Um, let me see, I'm just I'm trying to make sure that I'm 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 keeping an eye to the time. Um, again, we we looked at um, protecting voting rights. Of course, in 2021 session, in the 2021 session, we did um, a huge uh, package of of um, voting reforms to to ensure you know at, um, access to voting, to expand vote by mail, to expand. Um, uh, our utilization of ballot drop boxes, um, and uh, and the uh, protecting voting rights uh, bill was to ensure that we had had you know adequate in person precinct polling locations, um, so that so that we weren't although we we did utilize a re a reduced number of polling stations in 2020 due to the pandemic, we didn't want that to then become the model um, that, that somehow we were going to, to, to limit based on the fact that that had worked during the pandemic when we didn't have as many people going in person to the polls that we were then going to, to limit um, election day polling places that we were gonna limit those in-person precincts. So um, we wanted to make sure that, that we were keeping our access to our democratic process as broad and as, um, as, as simple as possible, because Maryland really has been leading in election access, sort of um, moving in the opposite direction from, from a lot of the rest of the nation. Um, there, uh, I'll just touch on a couple things from healthcare because I am actually going to do a town hall specific to, um, to some of our healthcare, but there are a few things that I, I just, I just want to brag about a little bit because I'm I'm super excited that we did them. Um, I touched touched on it a little bit early on. Um, the expanded dental coverage for adults on Medicaid. Um, this this was a bill that actually um, brought me to tears when when we voted for it because it is going to have such an, a significant impact on so many Marylanders. It doesn't come like you know. For, for, for the dollars that, that we're putting into it, the, the return is, is, is incalculable. Um, and so it's something that, that Maryland should be very proud of. We're, we're one of only a handful of states that have done this, but this is becoming a national trend. Um, so so we, are, we are on trend when it comes to delivering for, for our, our adults, um, our low-income adults in Maryland. 
um, we passed uh, the, the Maryland Suicide Fatality Review Committee. Um, I don't, I don't have to tell you that suicide is, is, is an epidemic. Um, it is, uh, yeah, and, and the impact on the family, on the community is incalculable. But um, this, uh, this committee will look at um, suicide prevention from a, from a different point of view than we've taken before. It's a different approach. It's identifying and addressing the factors that contributed um, to suicide deaths um, and how we can facilitate the system to change the state to prevent suicide. Um, so we've, we've had a lot of prevention initiatives, but this is just looking at it from a totally different perspective. Um, and so, so it was, it was really, uh, really important. I also uh, worked on the um, self-directed services work group. And out of that, we had uh, a, of bill, the Developmental Disabilities Administration Self-Directed Services um, Self-Direction Act of 2022. Um, a few years ago, there was a decision that really limited um, self-directed services for developmental, uh, for the uh, developmentally delayed, uh, disabled uh, community. And, um, and it actually made it much, much harder <laughs> Um, to access those services, it made it harder for family members to 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 be uh, providers and in, in, in care um, uh, assist with care, and it really limited the 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 um, the hours available and the resources available. So so we passed this bill to to ensure that um, that, that we were expanding those self directed services um, and that we were expanding. Um, that, that we were making it easier and clarifying how um, we were, how uh, recipients were receiving those services and also how they were being reimbursed because um, we really needed some clarity in the law because it was, it was becoming sort of this, this, this battle. Um, and so, uh, and, and that, that was a bill that, that um, Karen Lewis Young really, she's, she has spent a number of years um, working working on that policy. And so we met for um, the better part of a year uh, to, to develop the language of, of that bill. Um, and then there's, there's uh, two, other, two other things I wanna to touch on very quickly. One is the End the Weight Act. Um, and that was, uh, there were actually two, two sort of wait list bills that we worked on. One was, um, was for the, um, the uh, the waivers for um, for 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 autism, because um, again we we had this huge wait list for services, um, and uh, and the the end the wait act will actually reduce that 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 wait list by about fifty percent, um, so that so that people can get the care that they need, get the assistance that they need. Um, and the other uh, legislation that we worked on, the other, the other wait list program that we worked on was for, um, for uh, age in place services. Because again, we have this wait list that is so long and so dense um, that, that, that we, we actually have openings and we can't even identify eligibility until we get through the list. So, um, so we passed legislation that will require the Department of Health basically to, to come up with a policy, to come up with a plan um, to, to go through that, 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 that wait list um, to, to reduce it and make sure that, that we're getting people those services that they need so that, so that we can um, assist the autism <laughs> community and so we can assist our, our, our senior population who are, are looking to age in place but obviously need those services. Um, so I'm gonna pause here and, and just see if we have any questions in the chat. Um, and if not, let me see. Hmm? Oh, I'm, I'm, gonna pa I'm gonna pass it, pass it to, uh, to Mr. Luke. Hey everybody, thanks so much. And I uh, just wanna say, of course, thank you to Delegate Bagnell for such a comprehensive 
uh, summary of what has been happening. Of course, if you would like to see the full end of session letter provided by the delegate, you can see that on her website. And so you can just go to heatherbagnell.com uh, slash 2022 hyphen session hyphen recap and that will take you there but obviously you can find the link right off the website also uh, if you want to also check out uh, her legislative work of course you can uh, look up her profile on the Merlin General Assembly website and then we've had a few questions but they've all kind of basically been answered already uh, so I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about some of the future town halls and um, while I'm thinking about it, I'm just going to do this because now you can see me. There you go. All right. Um, so coming up next week, we have, as the delegate had mentioned, uh, a virtual town hall about uh, healthcare, and we're excited to uh, welcome some special guests for that. Uh, including uh, Vincent DeMarco from the Maryland Citizens Healthcare Initiative, Dan Martin from the Mental Health Association of Maryland, and our own uh, Anne Arundel County Health Officer, Dr. Nilesh Kalyanaraman. Uh, so please join us for that on Wednesday, uh, June the 1st, that's next Wednesday, at the same time, 6.30 p.m. Uh, we also have uh, four more town halls coming up after that, every Wednesday, basically. So June the 8th, we'll be talking about education, uh, the blueprint for moving forward. Uh, June the 15th, we'll be talking about the district, our new districts, and who represents you, uh, which will be a conversation about redistricting. Then on June 22nd, uh, as the delegate had also mentioned, we're going to be talking about expanding resources uh, for veterans. And we're very excited uh, for that one to be welcoming uh, Dan Tudor, a U.S. Naval officer retired, also Curtis Jones, a U.S. Marine Corps retired, uh, a candidate for Maryland Senate and here in District 33, Dawn Guile, and our Congressman, uh, Anthony Brown, who currently is our Congressman, but of course running for Attorney General. Uh, then uh, finally, we will be finishing off the series uh, on June the 29th. Uh, with the town hall about women's reproductive health care. And for that one, we are also welcoming uh, some special guests, uh, including our delegate Ari Ariana Kelly, who's the Vice Chair of the Health and Health Government Operations and the General Assembly, representatives of Planned Parenthood of Maryland, and Heather Miser, our candidate for US Congress in District 1. So if you have any of those or you would like to join us for any of those, uh, please do uh, go on to the website or onto the Facebook page and send us an RSVP so that we can join you uh, and send you, I should say, the joining information. What, of course, you can watch here on the YouTube channel uh, live as we broadcast on each of those occasions. But now I would like to thank everybody that has been watching uh, online here in the meeting and, of course, on our YouTube channel. Please do subscribe to the YouTube channel and then that way you can stay updated with everything that's coming up, including all of our community events. Uh, and for some final words, I'll pass back to Delegate Beckner. Thank you so much. And thank you for, for letting us know about the feedback issues. We figured out the, the, the problem, <laughs> but I'm sorry about that. Um, yes, as, as, uh, as I mentioned, we do have a number of, of um, upcoming town halls. Some of you may wonder why I, there were certain issues I didn't, I didn't talk about tonight. And that's because, because we are, um, we're going to have a couple of dedicated town halls specific to, to, um, to, sort of the broader issues, particularly on um, women's reproductive access um, in, because we had, a, we had a number of bills, um, including the Abortion Care Access uh, Act, um, but also also bills around a number of, um, of aspects of, of reproductive access. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I wanted to make sure that I was bringing in the experts um, and that I was dedicating enough time um, to, to answer all the questions, because I, I know tonight was in, you know, very quickly and very broad strokes. Um, so I just want to thank you all once again um, for, for being here. I know uh, right now is a challenging time and we're all sort of uh, reconciling um, how we feel about the, you know, the, the past um, few weeks events and, and particularly about um, yesterday's, you know, tragic uh, um, Mass, mass shooting at, at, at the school. So I'm just asking that, that, that we try and, and, and find a way to be, um, to be kind, to be thoughtful and, 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 and to, to, to hold our elected officials accountable um, because we are, 
we are not without um, we are not without means to take action. Um, but it but it it takes it takes a concerted effort. Um, I also wanted to to thank uh, Mr. John Wakefield, who is on this call, who speaking of taking action, is uh, is running for um, for District 33B um, to to represent you in the House of Delegates. Um, as as you know, we'll be talking about um, we'll be talking a little bit about redistricting in a future town hall. But of course, I am um, although I represent our entire District 33 uh, now through December, I will not have the honor of, of representing district-wide um, after 2022. Um, so I have, I, have, I have worked very hard to make sure that, that we had people running that, that are going to, to maintain the same level of, of responsiveness and compassion and passion uh, for this district that, that, that you have come to expect from me. Um, and we'll have, we'll have more opportunities to, to meet some of, some of the candidates going forward. Um, but I just wanted to, to take an, take, take an opportunity to, to thank, um, thank Mr. Wakefield for, for stepping up and, and, and stepping into the, into the race to represent, uh, District 33B. Um, with that, uh, we are coming up to time and I want to be respectful of your time and thank you once again for, for being here tonight. As always, if you have questions or concerns, um, my office is always open even when it's virtual. Um, feel free to email me at heather.bagnell at house.state.md.us or at heatherbagnell for delegate, that's the word F-O-R, uh, at gmail.com. And, um, and, and thank you all very much for the honor of representing you.